Hi, good evening. Hello, welcome to the Coracle Live Books, Bards and Ballads, um, sponsored by the Sisterhood of Avalon. And tonight I am so happy to be chatting with Tracy Andrick of One Path Labyrinth. Tracy is a certified labyrinth facilitator, certified birth doula, a Reiki master, crystal healing practitioner, and owner of One Path Labyrinth Ventures. She is the creator of Sacred Path Labyrinth Cards, which we will be speaking about later on in our, um, our discussion with her. And we're going to be covering all sorts of wonderful things with Tracy, how she got involved and the things that she makes. And the Sisterhood of Avalon sisters will know her most by uh, the workshops she teaches uh, at Ninefold Festival when we were, you know, in person. Mm -hmm. And um, the Sisterhood of Avalon mugs that she's made, and she also has made our 25th anniversary goddess ornaments. So, with no further ado, I would like to introduce my friend and sister, Tracy Andrick. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Susan. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm glad. So, why don't we start with how you got involved with labyrinths in the first place? I mean, it's kind of an odd, okay, just so not a labyrinth, then you walk it, but to go further than that. So, why don't you tell us your story? Okay. Um, so it was in 1998, and I had um, a little bit of a, um, awareness of the labyrinth and, and sort of what it was as a shape that I had saw, seen on a book um, and read a little bit about um, in a book, but it wasn't a book about labyrinths. Um, so in 1998, there was a festival in Newport, Rhode Island called um, the Women's Sacred Art Festival that I had been a part of and had been participating in and helping a little bit with the organization of. Um, and about a month before the festival, one of the organizers, the core um, organizers, suddenly passed away. Um, of a, a, She had a brain aneurysm mm -hmm. and it was very unexpected. Um, and so the other members, the other core members, um, you know, obviously took it very hard um, and were, you know, having a hard time um, dealing with their grief and, um, you know, planning this big festival. Mm -hmm. um, it was a week long thing and there were artists, art showings at different venues and lots of different workshops all over Newport. So um, we were asked to step in and help a bit with it. So we became a lot more involved. Um, and one of the um, the events was a labyrinth walk. Um, and it was at someone's home in their backyard. Um, and the labyrinth was actually a temporary labyrinth that was created with flour, like baking flour. Um, so it was, a, and it was a beautiful setting. It was at their home. You could see the ocean from where we were. It was at sunset. So the sun was going down. You could see the beautiful sunset and there were torches to light the area. And so everyone was gathering and, um, I saw the partner of the woman who had passed away um walking around the crowd and talking to people and he seemed to kind of have a purpose that he was you know uh, approaching people and um i think i had met him maybe once before um, but i didn't really know him and so he came finally came to me um and took my hand and put something in it and shut my hand and he said this walk is for molly that was the woman who had died his partner um, and he walked away and went on to the next person. And when I opened my hand, in my hand, I had Molly's bone and ash in my oh, hand. Wow. He had been going and giving little bits of Molly to everybody there. Um, and so we walked the labyrinth and, but in with purpose. And the purpose was to recommit Molly to the earth and bring her back to the mother. Um, and there's a chant by a woman named Jennifer Berezin called Returning. I, and you, yeah, you've probably heard of it. So those that, of you that don't know it, 
um, it was recorded in a hypogea in on Malta, the island of Malta. And what that is, is, is un, it's an underground temple. And there's an oracle there, so which is a tube in it. So the, the acoustics of it are just amazing. And so that was playing in the background and we were all chanting return, return to the mother. Um, and once we got to the center of the labyrinth, we put her ashes in the center to bring her back to the mother. And I still get goosebumps when I, and I've told the story hundreds of times now, um, and I still get goosebumps when I think about it and how powerful it was. I got goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a powerful it thing. It is. It is. And, you know, it brings some tears to my eyes when I think about it. It was just such a powerful moment. And so be, I think because it was such a touching and incredibly powerful experience for me, and my first time walking a labyrinth. So I had not ever walked a labyrinth before. I had only seen it on the cover of a book. Um, so just the act of walking the labyrinth to me was very powerful and somehow really touched my soul. So I went home and I was just obsessed with this newfound tool that I had been introduced to. And so I built um, a rock labyrinth in my yard and started to really use it a lot with the circle of women um, that I was involved with at the time. We, we were having monthly rituals, whether they were sabbats or esbets. Um, and so using that in our practices and just using it uh, you know, on a daily basis and it became a really important part of my spirituality. And so I did that for a few years, just really working with it on a spiritual level and a physical level. Um, but as I became more connected to it, I started to wonder about it. Like, where did it come from? Like, who, who thought it up and what was it used for? And, you know, so I just became very curious about it, you know, historically and and, um, you know, that kind of thing. And so I started to do some research. So I got books and I started to read about it. And what I found was it is very much connected to the cycles of life and death. So in, in the, the classical labyrinth, which is the seven circuit labyrinth, is over 4,000 years old. So it's a very, very ancient symbol and tool that was used in many different cultures around the world. Um, and one of the workshops that I offer is um, labyrinths all over the world. And so giving examples of the different countries that they were used in. And there's always a common theme, which is that the labyrinth is a portal between life and death and death and life. So when I came to that realization and found out that information, it just deepened the experience for me even more because what we did was we brought Molly to a portal and we helped her move to the other side. Right. And so once I found that out, um, it, uh, it's, it became much deeper for me than just this thing that I walk. Um, so that's that's how I became um, obsessed with and passionate about the labyrinth. And from there, I started to um, teach classes and um, became certified. So I'm certified by a, an organization called Veridita, <laughs> which is a na a, an international organization, and they've... Um, certified people from all over the world, thousands, they have thousands of labyrinth facilitators. And so it was a, a weekend long training. Um, I actually had to travel to Ottawa, Canada. So I drove up there. Um, there, there was a, a monetary commitment to it as there often is when you take trainings that are, um, you know, really important like this and give you a lot of um, tools to use. Um, so I had I had a camper that I sold so I could be able to go up there, travel up there and, and take this certification. And um, the woman who trained me, her name is Lauren Artress, um, and she is a priest um, in the Episcopal faith. She's from um, San Francisco, 
um, and her church is, um, of course, I can't think of it right now. So <laughs> hopefully it'll come to, to my head. But she was the person that really brought the labyrinth from Europe over to the United States. She was the catalyst for, for the modern labyrinth movement in the early 90s, the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and so it was really wonderful to um, take the training with a variety of different people. So people from all faiths and to be accepted there as a pagan um, and to learn the tools to talk to anybody about the labyrinth in their own language. So for instance, if I'm gonna do a workshop with people at a, you know, a Catholic church or a Baptist church, I'm gonna talk to them about how they can reach God through the labyrinth because it's a universal tool um, and it really transcends any specific religion or spiritual practice and anyone can use it. And that's one of the things I really love about it is that it, anybody could use it. Um, and it's not specific to one tradition or religion and um, people from all over the world have, have found um, value in it. So you're certified, are you, able to teach others so that they can become certified? Are you a teacher? I'm, no, I'm not a teacher for, of um, Veridita. I have done, um, I do some workshops that teach how to facilitate labyrinth walks. However, um, I'm not allowed to share any of the sort of trade secrets that I okay. learned from Veridita. <laughs> No, I, we all have our own mystery traditions. Right, right. But I, put, you know, I put my own spin on things and I have mm -hmm. over the years um, developed my own methods um, for doing things and my own formulas about how, you know, how to make uh, walks work. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what I share because I, I really want to see people bringing the labyrinth to their communities um, and, and offering that to people. And because it's, again, I think it's just such a wonderful tool. I, I like to call it the transformation superhighway because it really, ex it accelerates transformation um, and really helps people to focus. It's, it's a great tool for people who can't just sit quietly and meditate. It gets There's a lot of people who can't do that. I can't, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I fall asleep. <laughs> Um, I do want to mention to everyone watching that if you have any questions to feel free to put them in the chat and I will relay them to Tracy. And thank you, Shah, for putting in the um, Veredita. For Veredita. <laughs> and can you say, Audrey says that her husband and she built a seventh ring labyrinth in their backyard this last summer. Oh, that's wonderful. I love hearing that. It's so nice to have the tool right there um, for you to use every day. But there, there are um, many, many places that have labyrinths, public labyrinths that you could go and walk. Um, and a place to find it is there's a website called the World Labyrinth Locator. And I, I'm pretty sure it just is worldlabyrinthlocator.com or .org. It, I have it on my website. So if you wanted to go there, um, you could, there's the, the link there. Excuse me. And then so, you, just, you just put in a, a town or you can even put a zip code and it'll come up with a list of labyrinths in that area. And it'll tell you whether it's private or if it's public. It gives you um, contact information for private ones that you can contact the person to see if you can go walk it. But there's over 5000 labyrinths listed on it all over the world. So say if you were going to go on vacation to Italy. You could look up where labyrinths were. If there was one near where you're staying, you could go walk it. And that's one thing I love to do if I'm going to go somewhere. Not that I get to go on vacation often, but when I go different places, I like to look up and just walk labyrinths. We did that when we went to the Cape. Yes, we did. <laughs> uh, for anybody who wants to know, Tracy and I are actually very good friends. <laughs> we went away a couple of years ago for a weekend for... I guess it was both our birthdays because we're only a couple of weeks apart yeah. and she found us a labyrinth and we went and um, we walked it. It was lovely. But I think also one of the things we had talked about was some of the places where they have public labyrinths, they don't take care of them. There's one right here in my town and it's just, it's overgrown. 
you know, no one's taking care of it. So that's a shame because that takes that opportunity away from people to go and, and walk in. Yeah, that one's listed on the labyrinth locator and I had gone to walk it and I couldn't find it. I was looking and looking like, you know, yeah. it was on, on the lawn and I finally saw some little bricks there. So I um, and other people, other labyrinth walkers will do this. They'll write to the website and give an update of the condition of the labyrinth and whether or not it's walkable or, if, you know, if, if you can even find it and what the um, the condition of it is. So they did put a note on there that it, you know, has been overgrown and it, it's sad. And so, so people, um, labyrinth facilitators usually call those lonely labyrinths because they've been built and they're not used and the energy becomes very quiet. Um, one of the things about the labyrinth that I discovered was it has this energy signature of its own. And the, the more I used it and the more years went by that I became more and more deep, deeply connected to it, I started to feel it on much more of an energetic level than just physically and spiritually. And what I was feeling was that it's like this big ball so it goes, it makes like a dome up over the labyrinth, but then it also goes down into the ground. So it's like inside of this big um, energy ball that's like a toroidal vortex. So for those that don't know what that is, it's sort of like a donut shape. So there's a hole in the center. The hole can be really large or it can be very small. And the energy goes around in a circle, but it also goes like this. And it's one of the only shapes that will fold in on itself. And it's a shape that's found throughout nature. And they say that our universe is actually a tor toroidal vortex. And so I was really feeling this energy and, you know, kind of, I'm one of those people that I kind of um, will doubt myself sometimes. Like, am I really feeling this? Is this real? Am I just, you know, am I going crazy? Like what's going on? So as I started to reach out to other labyrinth facilitators and people, you know, who are passionate about the labyrinth and use it a lot, it, that was confirmed for me that that is a thing, that the energy of the labyrinth is there. And the more it's walked and the more people use it, the stronger the energy will become. But then these quiet, these lonely labyrinths, the energy gets very low. So people will find that sometimes they'll walk into a labyrinth and they'll be like, whoa, like, oh my gosh, what an experience. And I could really feel the energy and it like makes such an impact. And then there'll be other ones who are like, yeah, that was nice, you know, but it doesn't have quite the same flavor. Um, and it, yeah, it's really a shame about that one because it's in a lovely spot. It is a lovely spot. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not a facilitator, but I understand about the energy. I was fortunate enough the last few years of my mother's life, I was going down, you know, to Florida, you know, for anywhere from three to eight weeks. And I was lucky enough. I don't know how I stumbled upon it. It may have been my friend Sha helping. I don't know. But two miles away from her condo, there was a place with two labyrinths. Mm -hmm. And one was indoor that they really didn't let anybody use. But there was one outdoors. And I found that I started going there daily because I needed that time to myself, away from my mother. And then as the sicker she got, it was just I would just walk it and walk it. And even though it would be like a year in between my visits every day while I was there, I would go to the labyrinth. And I, as soon as I stepped on it, I could feel it because I was using it so much. So I definitely felt that. And even though a year went by when I went back, it only took like a couple of walkthroughs and and I could feel that again. And it was it was really, really helpful. Yeah, for sure. I just remembered it's Grace Cathedral um, in San Francisco. That was as Lauren's church. I believe she's since retired, but she had brought the labyrinth to her church and, and the, the, the um, folks there were very, very supportive of it. Um, and the, the labyrinth that they chose to use is the Chart Labyrinth, which is in Chart Cathedral in France. It's the, really the most famous one that people know. Um, so they decided that they wanted to create um, 
a canvas labyrinth, which is, and I have one of those as well. It's a nice tool that you can travel with and, and bring the labyrinth to people. Um, but it was really, her story is very interesting because when they started to try to draw it and put it together, they were having a really hard time getting it all to fit right. So that labyrinth has 11 circuits. It's considered a medieval labyrinth. Um, and it doesn't just go back and forth like this. There's different quadrants that you go through and, you know, it's very complicated. Um, although, of course, there's only one path in and one path out, but it's not it, the, you know, classic labyrinth where you're just kind of going in these circuits. So they ended up getting, um, finding someone who is um, an expert on sacred geometry and so he looked at it and figured out that there, you actually have to start with a 13 pointed star. And then everything else is based around this 13 pointed star. There's all of these little uh, semicircle things on the outside that they call cusps and foils. And all of those, they couldn't get, hadn't been able to get those to line up. And it was because you have to start with this 13 pointed star. So then they ended up um, commissioning someone to make a rug and they had a rug in the cathedral that they used. Um, and they do a lot of work with um, people in that, in that community that have HIV. Um, and they found that this was a great tool to help those people emotionally and spiritually and energetically. And so they ended up putting one on the outside of the cathedral as well so that people could just walk it at any time because obviously in the church it was only during certain hours right um yeah, yeah that's very similar to the one i found in in florida yeah, the, one yeah. in florida, the chapel and i did the other one which unfortunately was next to a golf course but it, it's <laughs> it's still what it was supposed to do so one of the things we have mentioned is from mary ann talking about the you say it very Veritas doing an online figure labyrinth and they have one that you can print out. So that's a great segue into how you got from the labyrinths into your pottery and onward. Yeah. yeah. So like I said, I had started teaching classes um, and one of the things I found and I actually this was very um, apparent to me when I actually took the um, the training up in Ottawa was I traveled up there with a friend of mine who was in a wheelchair and started to understand that the labyrinth isn't always accessible to everybody. So luckily the place that the training was at, their labyrinth was um brick the whole thing was was brick and it was flat so i was able to get her roll her up onto the labyrinth and take her around the circuits so that started to come into my awareness and one of my um interests and things that i think is really important is accessibility mm -hmm. um and I work, my full-time job is with a disability community. So it's something that's very much in the forefront of my mind always. And so when I also um, created my canvas labyrinth and started going places, um, I encountered a couple of instances where people um, had mobility issues and were not able to fully experience the labyrinth. So I started to think, well, you know, I think I need to start implementing some finger labyrinths into my trainings or at least have them available so that people who come and want to do the workshops um, that can't actually walk the labyrinth are able to participate. So I thought, OK, well, let me I'm going to play around with some clay. You know, I had I had um, printed out some they were pretty, you know, I had printed out some things on the computer and laminated them and those were nice and, and all. But I really wanted something kind of a little more substantial. So I started to play around with just air dry clay um, and made a few labyrinths and people 
seemed to really love them and were very interested in them, wanted to purchase them. And I was like, wow, really? So my husband ended up saying to me at one point, you know, my stepfather used to have a kiln. I wonder if he still has it. And he did. And he gave it to me. So and then I had a kiln. So I said, OK, now I can use real clay and real glazes and I can start creating these labyrinths for my workshops. So I did. And the response was just overwhelming um, that people wanted to buy them. And so I just started creating bunches of them and going to events and selling them and doing workshops and people, you know, would take one. So I say, okay, you know, pick one you can use and they take it. And then I couldn't get it back out of their hands again. They didn't want to let it go. Um, so that's how that started with the finger labyrinths. And then, um, just starting to, um, you know, experiment more with different shapes and different um, magical tools, I like to call them. So even though like, you know, the, the mugs that I made for the sisterhood, um, you know, it's a drinking mug, but to me, it's a, it's a magical tool. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have your tea in it and you can feel the energy. All of my stuff, I reiki my clay before I work with it. I reiki and pray over my kiln. I smudge and make my space sacred. So the whole process from beginning to end um, is a spiritual one for me. And I put a lot of love and healing energy into everything that I make. And then the purpose is um, to get people to have something magical that they love and that makes them feel um, wonderful and helps them with with on their spiritual path. So I just started like playing with all these different things and started making different things. And now I'm making mugs and chalices and teapots and, and signs and all kinds of things. And I just, it's one of the things that I really love and really feeds my spirit to be able to create those kind of things with, um, with the energy and the love and the spirituality and, and have see those go out into the world. Like I just sent a green man chalice to Australia. Oh, wow. So that's like cool. just, yeah. I, and that's the second thing I actually did send someone from there, bought one of my finger labyrinths a few years ago. So to be able to have things out in the world is really special to me. Well, we've got some comments coming in. Um, Deborah says that she loves your finger labyrinth and she's playing with it right now. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Two people want a teapot. <laughs> and Anita asked if I can find the question again. Okay, when you're walking the labyrinth, when you get to the center, the, um, the picture, the symbol that is there is not always the same. Right. You know, it, does that affect the energy in different ways, depending on on what's in the center of, of the labyrinth? I think it does. I think um, what you put in the center, what you put around the outside. So when I create labyrinths, I like to incorporate symbolism. I like to incorporate crystals. Um, so I think really setting the intention for... Um, for what the purpose of the labyrinth is, I definitely think it does affect the energy, the focus, um, and the experience that people have, for sure. So before we move on to other things, do you want to show some of your, the finger labyrinths? Sure. And then we can talk about the cards. Yeah. So here's one of them I thought you guys might like because it has a little goddess on it. So there's that and it has a little star in the center um and so this is a seven circuit labyrinth and then and i do custom work too which i love 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 to do and i have hundreds of stamps that i can do different symbols and different animals like this one has a bear paw on it if you can see Oh, yeah. A little bear paw. And sometimes I put crystals in the center um, because I think that really helps with the energy if you're walking it and you get to the center and then you can just hold your finger on the crystal. It really helps. And it's got oak leaves on the sides. 
And I'll just show you one more. This is a chakra labyrinth. So I've got all the chakra symbols around the edge. Yeah. And then I've got the ohm. And this one just has a clear crystal in the center. I really like clear crystal. That's one of my favorite things to work with. Um, I think it's really good for holding energy and, and um, transmitting energy. So these labyrinths that have the clear quartz in the center um, are really good for, um, they almost act like a microphone to the universe. So you're sending out your, your wishes, your desires, your goals out into the universe um, through the crystal. Well, I guess from there we can talk about, so I have one of your mini labyrinths, which I just got. <laughs> <laughs> this is the mini labyrinth, comes with these beautiful cards that Tracy created. Um, I'll just, I'll show just a few here and then she can talk about, um, how she came up with the idea of making these cards and putting them together with the mini labyrinths. So, so we've got chakras and transformation um, elements as well. We have air and water. And I guess also that I have only looked through these a little bit. We also have the seasons is spring and autumn so the cards are absolutely stunning and i'm looking forward to sitting down and and really starting to work with them with the finger labyrinth but how did you come to make the cards <laughs> So I, um, I love cards. I have lots of different decks um, that I love to play with. And so I really wanted a deck that was labyrinth focused. Um, and there's not many out there. I think there's like two. One of, yeah, so I, and I have both of them. One of them, so I'm also certified, um, a certified labyrinth facilitator through the New England Labyrinth Guild, which is no longer in existence. Um, but when I took that training, um, they gave us a set. Um, they're more Christian focused in their um, language on the cards. So even though I, I liked them and I used them in the beginning, they just didn't speak to me because that's not my path. Um, and mm -hmm. so I looked around and I found another deck, um, a man in um, Ireland, Tony Christie created. Um, and I got those and I used those for a while, but again, they just didn't, I just didn't connect with them for some, for whatever reason. I'm not sure why his, um, aren't Christian focused, um, but I don't know. You know how you just sometimes connect with a deck, sometimes you don't, if it may speak to you or it doesn't. So I kind of had it in my head for a long time that I wanted to create my own deck. Um, but I started off trying to write a book, which I have two different books about a quarter of the way written, but as <laughs> Susan knows about me. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not good at expounding in the written form. So, um, but I am a graphic designer. So um, I thought, well, let me try. Just sort of starting to play around. So I started to play around with the imagery, um, and knew what I wanted for cards. I knew I wanted chakras in there. I knew I wanted the seasons. I knew I wanted other specific um, focus things like transformation, um, communicating with the ancestors, that kind of thing. So I, I knew what it was in those other decks that I was missing. So I started working on it and it took me three years to come up with that deck. Um, and about two and a half years into it, I, I was like, okay, I finally somehow, I don't know how, got a fire under my ass. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And um, there was an event that was coming up in the summer. And I, I was like, I, that's it. I'm going to get it done. And I'm going to have these cards ready for this event. 
so I did. So, um, and it was, it was complicated and, and confusing um, trying to find a place for me to um, publish them um because i you know they're self-published and um fit having the right amount of cards to fit in the the box and so it was like this confusing crazy formula to try to get it all to come together um and then i want and i i wanted the book that goes with it to um to not have a, a ton of explanation because the cards are really, I wanted them to be more thought provoking so that when people use them, they can look at the book and kind of get a feel for what the the meaning of the cards were. But in the book, um, it, it's more of sort of a questioning description, like, um, you know, how do you feel about things? Where are you in your life? Where are you going? How does this card speak to you and what you're going through right now? So I wanted the the images, the the language and the descriptions to be more simple um, mm -hmm. so that people could form their own uh, meaning in, in how it connects to, to their spirituality. So um, that was... I think three or so years ago that I finally published them and I've sold over 150 decks now. So that's pretty exciting. Did you do the artwork? I did the artwork. Yeah. The artwork is, is absolutely stunning. Thank you. And they're bright and they're vivid and you can feel the energy just yeah just looking at them you know they're they're gorgeous they're gorgeous yeah so each each card has a labyrinth in it somewhere yes. some of them are very obvious others are not like the um the air card the, la the circles. yeah they're in the bubbles <laughs> labyrinths. Um, i mean this is lovely you've got the labyrinth but you've got the the peace sign yeah and it'll find peace in the sacred center so they're beautiful, and I will say that um, her Etsy is what One Path Labyrinth. Labyrinth. Yep, One Path Labyrinth. Etsy, um, my my website is onepathlabyrinth.org, so you can go there. Um, you can connect to my Etsy store through there. I also have a page that talk that lists um, some events I'll be at. Although I do have to update it for this year. Um, and there's a resource page too, that you can go to with lots of different labyrinth, um, links that you can go find out information about the labyrinth. Of course, Verdita is there and the labyrinth society, um, on Facebook here, there's a labyrinth, a global labyrinth society group that you could join that people from all over the world that love the labyrinth share, share their experiences and their art and their, um, the labyrinths they create and all that kind of stuff. So I was hoping somebody was going to come to my house this summer and help me build. One. <laughs> well, there's always the summer. <laughs> <laughs> there's always the summer. But I have to build my own labyrinth because I'm in a new location now. I, I know. Have my labyrinth behind. I was so sad, but I did bring some rocks from it here. So okay. I have to recreate it. Where Tracy lived before, she had a labyrinth in her backyard that was absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So now it's time. We'll do yours and then we'll do mine. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, we should look into, since we have people that want teapots. Oh, okay. Sure, 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 teapot. A teapot that you've got. Okay. So this is, see, it's got a little sun on that side. And then this side, it has a moon and the little cup. And the, the cover can come off and go on just on top of the teapot to keep your tea nice and hot. And it's got the little cup. So this set just has the one little cup, but I do, I'm working on some sets that have two cups. Um, the teapot is 16 ounces and the cups are eight ounce each. So you could have a tea for two. Um, and again, I love to do um, custom orders. And I just had a request from somebody through my Facebook page 
um, that wants me to do a Krampus teapot set, which is, sounds like so much fun. And I do, I do love Krampus and I have some um, Krampus mugs that I've been selling. Um, but, and I, so right now, just for stock, I have this teapot and I have a purple one that has um, black ravens on it. And um, I think it has the triquatra symbol on it too. But yeah, I love doing cool. custom stuff. So if you come up with something that you're like, oh, I love this. There's, uh, there's just so much. I mean, like I said, we have the, um, the monks that you made for the Sisterhood of Avalon, which some of us are hoping that we can start up again. Yeah. We orders and it's like we're out of stock and, you know, I've had to refund. And uh -huh. um, I don't have my 25th anniversary goddess ornament handy that you made but that was that was gorgeous and just since everybody now knows we're friends I can show this uh can you see it Tracy made this for me it's got a little goddess on it and all the amethyst and uh what else onyx I think is on it oh I think it was um laboratory maybe I can't really see it now that it's on me um and uh, also, we we had uh, what the Owen, the Owen symbol pendant that you had yeah, made. Yeah, I still great. have some of those left on my Etsy store. Yeah, so I love that. I wait for those in the sisterhood or anyone else who follows Owen. Um, those were, I think you got a bunch of people here that want your teapots. So <laughs> <laughs> you better get moving. <laughs> Well, make sure you guys send me a message so that I yes, take absolutely exactly what you want. I have two in production right now, and they both have labyrinth symbols all over them. So, if you want something with the Owen symbol or the Triskel or you know anything, like I said, I have hundreds of different um, stamps that I use and cutouts. Um, and my son also got last year a three D printer, so he's been printing stamps for me so i just have to send him a picture and he does it for, whips it up for me and so i can can really go all do all kinds of things but i am excited to do the cauldron mugs again which i started to do i had to stop for a while because i was stupid and i fell off a chair you weren't stupid don't say yeah that. i i was stupid i was standing on an office rolling chair trying to get something off the top shelf of a closet and the chair slipped out from under me and I went down and hurt myself. Um, but I started again. And so like, I have this one that I could show you. That's the um, Thor's hammer oh, mug. Yes. Yeah. Oh, with the tall picture, that's nice. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's the cauldron shape. Um, and I always, I like to do, that's kind of my signature to do the little. Yeah, I, like, I like the, um, the yeah. Bottom. And, and they always come out different looking, which is fun. Um, yeah, because it looks complete, because I have another one. That's black, the cauldron mug, yeah. and it has the goddess similar to this one on it. And uh, that has the curly cue. Yeah. That one. Yeah, I like making the curly cue. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, sometimes I, I curse them because they, they break. They're very fragile before I fire them. And if I'm not super careful, I end up breaking them. So like when I was doing the order for the sisterhood, um, I think I broke like half of everything, like however many I made you guys, I think it was like 20 or something. Like that. I probably <laughs> broke like eight of them in the process. <laughs> well, I don't know if you remember, I took one of those broken ones. I had you make it without the handle oh, and, right. it's black, and it's just the large cauldron mug. And if anyone's interested in a broken one, <laughs> I got and I use it as a scrying bowl. <laughs> So it has no handle. It's just the bowl. It's black. It looks like a cauldron. You know, fill it with water, and you can use it as a scrying bowl. Yeah. So <laughs> there's, there's that. And I'm um, making um, chalices too. So here's just one example of one. This one's got butterflies all over it because I just love butterflies. But I have this shape. I have another one that's really thin um, and more. Um, I don't know. I want to say ladyish, but. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right way. To How about call delicate? It. Delicate. There we go. Yeah, it's not delicate, delicate as, and it's going to break delicate. easy, but it's yeah, it's it's more <laughs> delicate. <laughs> so, is there anything else you want to show us that you're 
you know, works in progress. Oh. Or... I also, I'm, these are the, some of the little sign things I make. So I have that. I had made one for somebody. She wanted one to put on her door um, when she was doing her magical work um, and she didn't want her family to disturb her. So it says magic afoot and she puts that on her door. Um, oh, that's nice. Yeah, I just, I love making different things. I've made a lot of signage type of stuff like that um, for um, Christmas gifts for my family. Um, I, my mom just bought a new beach house. So I made her one with a mermaid that says Betty's Beach. <laughs> And I just I just commissioned you the other night for something. So That's right. yeah. 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 So and, and, and again, like I love doing um custom orders. I just did one for somebody. She wanted a set of 16 um a, a, a dinner set. So it's eight plates and eight bowls with a goddess on it that looks like a um a, the night sky. And so I really love creating special things for people because um you know it, it, it how you know when you have something in your mind that you want that's special and to see it come to life um i love being part of that process and the, the stuff i mean i've seen so much of your stuff from when i used to visit you before you moved um i have this and i'm sorry to say that it did crack and oh, i know that Oh, yeah. It's cracked a little bit, but I did fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this one. It's got all the, the Triskels and the, the spiral. Um, Avalon blue, of course. What a pretty um, dress you have on. What? What a pretty dress you have on. Thank you. <laughs> I got it a Cracker Barrel. <laughs> <laughs> they have good clothes there. I, I got a dress here once. <laughs> they really do, and they're fairly yeah. inexpensive. Yeah. So, expensive. Um, so is there anything else you want to touch on? I mean, I know for local people, you're going to hopefully be doing the make your own labyrinth workshop. Yes. Yeah, so um, I have one coming up on March 27th, and I do have a couple of spaces left. If anyone um, local is interested, you can send me um, an email and I can tell you how to register. So it's um, 11 to 2, you'll come. Um, we'll do a labyrinth ritual where you'll walk my canvas labyrinth, and then we'll go down into the pottery studio, and I'll walk you through making your own one of those ceramic finger labyrinths. Um, and I'm going to feed you a little lunch, um, and then you'll come back again on, I think it's April 10th, and your piece will be fired. And you'll walk the labyrinth again with your piece. Um, and then we'll go back down in the studio. You can pick out what glazes you want and glaze it whatever color you want. Um, one of the people that's coming had asked about um, adding crystals to it. She has some special crystals she wants to do to use. And unfortunately, they can't be fired because they'll melt because the kiln is a really high temperature. But what we do is we just take the crystal and impress it into the clay before it, uh, when it lets still wet to make the hole for it. And then it gets glued in later on. So, you know, if people have special pieces they want to incorporate into theirs. Um, so the, the second um, session, again, is 11 to 2. You'll get lunch. Um, and then a couple of weeks after that, I'll mail you your finished piece to your, to your home. Um, and I really wanted to keep it um, affordable for people because it's important to me um, for people to have this tool for themselves to use. Um, so it, the, for both sessions, it's $80, um, which, you know, I think is, is really right. affordable. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have two two times to come and we'll have ritual and walk the labyrinth. And so it'll be really nice. So I do have a couple of spots left still, if anybody's interested, that's, so I'm in Thompson, Connecticut, um, which is the top right corner of the state. So if you're from, you know, the, the Worcester area or from Rhode Island or in Connecticut, it's, it's an accessible place to come. Well, I'm going to catch you on the next one. Yeah, I know. You're busy with your astrology. Um, yeah, classes and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so I will. And, and my daughter, Jennifer, as well. 
Um, so is there anything else that you would like to touch on in our last few moments? Well, I think the, the big thing I want to impress on people is how, um, how useful the labyrinth can really be. And there's been times in my life where I've been um, in, in some deep grief and have had some really serious mental health issues. And I've always found that the labyrinth was a great tool to get me through those times. Um, like I said, I like to call it the the um, transformation superhighway because it does accelerate transformation. Um, and people all over the world are using it now, and it's really become um, more mainstream than it ever was before. And you'll find it at hospitals and schools. Lots of schools are using it now to help their students. And in fact, there was a study several years ago um, where they had kids with ADHD use the labyrinth, a finger labyrinth for, um, it was, it was a, just a few minutes a day, a few times a week. And they really found that there was a big difference in these kids as far as their ability to focus and calm down. So it's, it's a tool, whether you're walking it or you're using a finger labyrinth um, that can help you to center and ground. And I really like to use it as a way to um, reach goals. So I have on my um, bureau is my personal altar and I have my personal labyrinth there. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll put things around my labyrinth that will remind me of where I'm going, where I wanna go, how I wanna get there. Um, and then I use the labyrinth to help me daily to keep focused on those things. And one of the ways that the labyrinth is used very often is as you're on your way in. So as you're moving, whether you're using your finger or you're walking and you're moving towards the center, you're releasing what doesn't serve you anymore. So whether, you know, it be fear or, um, you know, what, whatever it is that something that's hindering you from growth. And so as you're walking in, you're just allowing that to drain out of you into the labyrinth. When you get into the center, like I said earlier, that's the portal. So that's your time to reach out to the above and the divine or the below and the ancestors, um, to be open to your guides, to... Um, you know, whatever, however you see divinity and whatever those entities are that you connect with in your spiritual practice. And it's also a time to just pause. We don't often give ourselves that time to just be in the moment. And it's that time to be in the moment. And again, if you're somebody that can't just sit still and meditate, you can do yoga poses. You can chant. You can do something active that helps you to get into that mode of re being receptive. So it's your time to be receptive to those messages, whether it be from the divine or your higher self or the ancestors or whatever it is that you're trying to connect with. One of the poses I like to use when I'm in the center of the labyrinth is to have my hands up like this and then have my legs um, shoulder width apart. So I'm kind almost like a hourglass shape. And what that helps to do is it helps to channel the energy from the below up into you and from the above down. So you're acting like a funnel. So then, and then on your way out, you're picking the energy back up. So I'm not a person who believes in just releasing and then it's gone because you're leaving a hole in yourself. Even if it's something that's not serving you, you're releasing something and it needs to be replaced. So what the labyrinth does is it transforms that thing that you have let go into something that you can use. So like I used the example of fear, I release the fear on the way in, the labyrinth is gonna transform it to courage. Um, or it may not be courage, it may be, some, it may be stability. Maybe I need, I'm, I'm fearful because I don't feel stable in my life. So coming back out and really just listening to the labyrinth because it's going to meet you where you are. So you may go in with a specific focus in mind thinking I'm going to work on such and such. 
but then you have to listen to, to your intuition. You have to listen to the energy of the labyrinth and allow it to guide you to what you really need. Um, so a good example I like to use of that is a woman who was in a workshop of mine. And she afterwards, she shared that um, when she was coming out of the labyrinth, she felt her knee started to hurt really bad and that it hadn't hurt in 10 years or something like that. So I said, well, what was happening 10 years ago when your knee was bothering? And you said, oh, I, I was getting divorced at the time, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, you know, I think the labyrinth is probably telling you that there's some sort of um, issue that's been unsolved and unresolved around that time in your life. And it's asking you to take a look at that. So it's really, you know, being in the labyrinth and being open to, to um, other um, messages and um, focus than maybe you had thought going in. So coming out and picking up that energy, that transformed energy to fill yourself back up again, I think is really important. All right. Well, we have a few questions before we end. <laughs> Anita's trying to give you a new line of work. <laughs> we travel to help people build a labyrinth on their property. Yes, I'd love to do that. <laughs> too. And, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there you go. She'll probably be getting in touch with you. Okay. <laughs> and uh, does it make a difference if you are alone or with others in the labyrinth? I think both have value. I think it's really important when you're doing your um, really deep spiritual work to try to find time where you can be alone in the labyrinth. Um, but walking the labyrinth with other people, specifically um, your community, um, is really very powerful. I like to say that hugging in the labyrinth is like hugging times a million um, because you're in a spiritual place. You've, you've sort of left the mundane, regular world mm -hmm. and you've entered into this magical, spiritual, energetic place. And when you're meeting other people on the path, you're meeting them. It's really that namaste moment. You're meeting each other heart to heart, soul to soul, spirit to spirit. And so when you're hugging each other, um, it's really your souls are hugging each other. Um, so I think labyrinth walking with other people, um, it can be very powerful. Um, it's a really great community builder. Um, I love doing um, ritual in the labyrinth. Transformation rituals are wonderful. And I have one that I've developed. If anyone's interested, um, you can contact me and I can tell you how I do it. If you want to bring it to your own group, I can I can um, give you the instructions on how to do it. But I always I do tell people um, in my workshops that, you know, if they can find a place near them that they can walk it alone, um, that that's really um, useful for their own spiritual um, work because there's not a distraction of meeting other people in the labyrinth. And finger labyrinths are really great for that because you can sit in your space alone and work with it. And um, I've gotten into some really, really super deep trance states using the labyrinth. But it's one of those things where, you know, it, I think I did it for like maybe two or three hours, um, just over and over, you know, going to the center, coming out, going to the center, coming out and just doing it over and over and over again. And there there is stories of um, witches in um, Europe who would use slate um, labyrinths, uh, it would be drawn on a slate and they would use a stick and they would use it to get into trance states. So it's, it is really useful for that kind of work as well. But again, I think both, um, walking and using it alone and using it with other people have, um, have great value just in different ways. Yeah. I've done it with people twice. Once was with you, which was lovely. And once in Florida at that one I was using with my mother, there was another woman there and I was just doing my thing. And for some reason she decided she didn't like the way I was walking it. And she started yelling at me. Oh, no. I, it was, it was weird. And it just kind of, I was like, like, 
almost like bring, being broken, woken up from a, a dream suddenly, because I was just so focused on what I was doing. And then there was this strange woman started yelling at me. And I was like, very, it's like, okay, I'm leaving now. <laughs> I just, I just everything and I left. Um, we have a last question from Audrey. Do you ever connect chakra energies and or the tarot archetypes when walking the labyrinth? I haven't worked with the tarot archetypes, but I do very frequently incorporate the chakras into my labyrinth work. Um, I just was, um, I taught a class a few weeks ago at an event called Feast of Lights. It was online. It's normally an in-person, but you know, the stupid COVID thing. Um, and it was focused on that using the labyrinth in conjunction with your chakras because the classical labyrinth has seven circuits and we have seven chakras. So each circuit is a chakra. So when you walk in, that first go around is your root chakra. When you go to the next go around, you go up to the next chakra. So you just work your way up the chakras till you get to the center and you're at the crown chakra. When you come back out, you go down. So the first one you walk is your crown chakra. And the way I like to do it is, so on the way in, the first circuit is my root chakra. I'm going to release something from my root chakra that's not serving me. The next circuit, I'm going to release something from my sacral chakra. And I go on like that. On the way back out, I, you know, you're starting up at the crown and working your way down. I'm bringing something um, that transformed formed energy into me as I work down through my chakras. Yeah, that's one of my really favorite ways to use the labyrinth, actually. Excellent. And you have all the chakras in your... I do, yeah. All the chakras are in the deck. That will help. Well, it's sitting right here. Okay, do we have any questions before we um, bring this to a close? Anyone else? Okay, Tracy, I just like to say thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's been a pleasure talking to you it's, again. It's, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I, I'm so glad you were able to do this. It's been, it's been fun. And hopefully everyone will pop over to your website or your Etsy page and um, check out all your stuff. Anita says thank you very much. It was a fabulous discussion. Thank you. And feel free to, um, you know, send me an email through my website. Um, if you have any questions about the labyrinth, if you want to, I'd be happy to jump on a Zoom with you to talk about it. I'm always happy to talk about the labyrinth. And like I said, I want to share all of my work that and all of the um, things I've discovered along the way with people so that they can bring it into their own lives and into their own communities. So I'm happy to share all those things with you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Tracy. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Susan. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. So before we leave, I just, uh, let's see. So please join us again on Friday night. I believe it's April 4th. And I will be chatting with Suzanne O'Gara, uh, one of our sisters. And her company is Alchemy of Avalon. So hope to have you all join us then. And uh, I wish you all good night, good morning from wherever you are. And um, be well. Good night. Good night.